Okay, everybody, welcome back. So, I told you about the doohickeys, relative pressure and relative specific volume. Now let's actually use them because there's no point in me just talking about them until you see them in action because they're very, very simple um, as long as you can navigate a table um, and they make these problems just work really easily. Now, what do we have here? We have a piston cylinder device that contains air. Okay, that's helpful. Then it goes a reversible thermodynamic cycle. Okay, reversible, helpful word right there because it means it's isentropic. Initially, air is at 400 kilopascals and 300 Kelvin, and with a volume of 0.3 meters cubed. Air is an expanded ice thermally to 150 kilopascals, compressed adiabatically to initial pressure. Okay, initial pressure, good. And finally, compressed at the constant pressure to the initial state. Accounting for the variation of specific heats. This means we have to use the tables when we're talking about an isentropic process. We can't just use our nice isentropic relations. Determine the work and heat transfer for each process. Use data from tables. Fantastic. Okay, so first off, let's draw this diagram. That'll help us figure out where we need to go. Okay, so for one, two, it said it was isothermal, which on a PV diagram looks like that. From two to three, it's isentropic, which is just a curved line that's slightly different on a PV diagram. And then finally, my constant pressure. I could have done this on a TS diagram, but this one works fine. It all connects together, and I know that the area inside of this is my net work output, which is another cool little detail. Okay, now with this, we're going to find out some information. So let's take it one process at a time. So first off, from 1 to 2, I'm isothermal. My temperature is therefore constant. My pressure isn't necessarily constant. My temperature is. And so what I can do is I can go ahead and look up a lot of information I'm going to need here. I'm getting internal energy for this one because I'm trying to find out heat transfer or work produced. I'm going to be looking at internal energy because this is a closed system, it's a piston cylinder device, and so not enthalpy because there's nothing flowing in this one. I'm also having to pull out our first doohickey, our relative pressure, which is 1.386. We're going to need this because I'm trying to figure out how I go from 2 to 3. I'm going to need to know what the pressure difference is, and that's going to help me out a lot there. Okay, so this first one was pretty simple. It's isothermal. I just looked it up in the tables. I didn't really have to do much there because I knew enough. I knew both the pressure and the temperature for that first state. And since I knew both, I could go ahead and find my initial internal energy and my final internal energy because this is air and it's an ideal gas. So now we're going to have to use the relative pressure to find state three. I'm going to show you the equation and then I'm going to show it to you in the tables. So the equation is super simple. I want the relative pressure for state three because then I'll be able to find the temperature and therefore the internal energy of state three. That's simply equal to the relative pressure at state two times my ratio of pressures from state two to state three, okay? From state two to state three. So using that information, I can solve. I would get that my relative pressure for the final state would be 3.696. Okay, now let me show that to you in the tables. So here I'm in my McGraw Hill Connect. Um, as a note, I'm using relative pressure and relative volume. For this book, I have to find the ninth edition. You can find them online, like it's not terribly difficult to find tables with relative pressure and relative volume on it. Um, they just use a new term which is called S plus, which I really greatly disagree with. I mean, if one's been using for working for 10 years, why not use it's been working? So I'm just going to show it to you here because it's easier for me to pull up this way. So there we go. I'm going to go down to air. These are ideal gas properties for air because I'm working with air. I click on it. For some strange reason, it drops me down to the bottom of the table rather than the top. I scroll up, and here it is. So what you can see already is that the third column and this column, the fifth column, those are my relative pressure values and relative specific volume values. So earlier I found for 300 Kelvin, I believe it was 300 Kelvin. I'll just pick 300 Kelvin for now. I can look here and find my relative pressure. There was 1.386. And I used my ratio of pressures to figure out what it was going to be afterwards, which is going to be about 3.7. So if I want to find my temperature and my internal energy, for my final state, I need to find 
the right row that has the right specific volume. So I scroll down, and sadly it's somewhere in between these two values. Like it's between 390 and 400. So, I mean 3.696 is probably about halfway, so I would guess it's around 395. Um, just spitballing it here. And then from that I can then find my internal energy and any other values I would want right here. But really I only need internal energy for right now. Let's make sure that's the right row. That was the wrong one. Should have known. Sorry, my bad. Here we go. Third column. That's internal energy. So it would be somewhere in between these two. I would need to interpolate to get the exact answer. But this is all you're having to do. I find my value for specific or for relative volume or against relative pressure. And I go over here and I find my value for internal energy and anything else I wanted. I need to interpolate for all of them. Okay, so that being said, I want to show you that. Um, let's jump back to the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm not jumping back to the PowerPoint just yet. I said you could find these online. I did want to show you that you can indeed find them online. So I just type this in the Bing. You're like, why do you use Bing? Well, I get points for it. Don't judge me. Um, and <laughs> they're paying me. Why not? I have to switch to Google sometimes. And the Engineering Toolbox is a pretty good website. I click on it. I get to assign units. And right here, I have something very, very similar to my table. It's also very nice that it highlights everything as you go over it. And I can find my relative pressure for a particular temperature and go from there. So not horribly bad. These steps are a bit bigger. As you can see, it goes from 350 to 400. So interpolating might be a bit more dicey. But you can also find places that have better um, more finer values if you want to. Okay, just want to show you that you could find those on the internet pretty easily. That was the first search result. Beyond that, now back to our PowerPoint. And here we are. So I interpolated, and when I interpolated, what I find is my temperature would be 396.6 Kelvin, and my internal energy is 283.71. Okay, so I have a lot of information here. I have found my temperature in all three states. I know my pressure at all three states. I know my internal energy at all three states. And so from that, hopefully, I can solve for the rest of this problem. So let's see here. What do I actually want? I wanted the work and heat transfer for each process. OK, now work should clue you in that we're not quite done solving things yet. Reason? Work, if you remember your equation a long time ago, work is equal to the integral of P dV. And so that big thing at the end right there is saying, well, how's my volume change? I need to know that to be able to figure out my work. So we have to figure out those volumes as our next step. It won't be too hard. So mass will help us get the actual energy work and actual heat transfer rather than just work per unit mass or heat transfer per unit mass. Um, air is an ideal gas. At our first state, we know the pressure, volume, temperature, and specific gas constant. So we just plug it in there and we get our mass. After that point, we know our volume in our first state. It's given in the problem statement. What's our volume in our other two states? Well, we know our pressure and our temperature in all three states. And so we can actually solve for that pretty easily. So I can get my volume 2 and volume 3, once again, just using my ideal gas equation. This time, though, I'm plugging in my mass. If you're wondering, did you round? I round a little bit, okay? I mean, don't judge me. And so with that, I get a value of 0.8 meters cubed and 0.3966 meters cubed. That's going to really help us out as we're calculating our work um, a little bit later on. Okay, now since we have most of those values, we're at the point now where we can start taking it one step at a time and figuring our heat transfer and our work for each of these. Okay, so let's look at the heat input and work for state one to two. I'm putting this out here just to remind you of what's going on for each of these. So for this first state, if I drew, first, sorry, first process, goodness. If I have my PV diagram, I go down like this. And what you need to realize is it said that that was an isothermal process. So this is a PV diagram. And this guy right here is a TS diagram. On an, an isothermal process on a TS diagram, it's just a straight line. And what we learned earlier on is that the area under that TS diagram 
Well, that's equal to my heat input or output, depending on what I'm trying to do. And so it's a nice straight line. So all I realize here is that it's just TDS. The area of this is a rectangle, and so I can find my heat input really easily. Now, what is my change in entropy from state 1 to 2? Well, it did not say that it was isentropic, okay? It did not say that it was isentropic. So I can't just do that. So I'm going to use this equation right here. You're like, well, where does this come from? This one is that whole equation before where we said that S is equal to the integral of, make sure I do the right one, yes, yeah, CPT dt minus mass R, oh, yeah, minus R, natural log of my pressures. There we go. Okay. And we said that this term right here, well, you're equal to S naught. We'll get that from the tables. So what I've done right here is I have just said, okay, I'm trying to find the change in entropy. So that would be S2 minus S1. And so that would be equal to S1 naught, I can't do things in the right order, sorry, S2 naught minus S1 naught minus the ratio. And these two we said were equal to each other. And since they're equal, they canceled out. So that's how our equation simplified down dramatically here. And so we get our entropy change was 0.3923 kilojoules per Kelvin. And then with that, we can plug it in and get that our heat input is 117.7 kilojoules. 117.7 kilojoules. Okay, it also says this is a reversible thermodynamic cycle. Reversible simply meaning that any heat input will be exactly equal to my work output. Okay, now let's go from two to three. So from two to three, I have an isentropic process, okay? And so in this case, I'm not having to really struggle to figure out what my heat input is um, because I already know my internal energy change is between those two states. And you're like, wait, why don't we just do internal energy for the first one? Well, for this one right here, this is an isentropic process. So delta S is equal to zero. But one thing you need to remember about delta S is that it is adiabatic. Okay, Adiabatic simply means that my heat input is equal to zero. You're like, okay, fine, that's all fine and dandy. Why didn't we deal with that the first time? Well, last time I was saying is that my temperature does not change. Temperature was constant, which meant that this part right here was zero. So that meant that my E in was equal to E out. That was for my first state. Now, sorry, first um, process. Now for my second process, going from point two to three, from here to here, well, my change in energy system is not zero, but my energy out I should say my heat out is equal to zero. So what I have here then is I have no heat input, no work input for that process. It is decreasing volume, so I would actually have work input. So I would have work in minus heat out is equal to change energy in my system. My pen is going bonkers right now. That's okay. Work in, heat out, fix it. We said that guy is zero. And so what I'm going to get then is that my work in is equal to my change in energy of my system. And so from that, I know my change in energy system is. It's just my mass times my change in internal energy. Okay, so that's the second one. 80 back, there's no heat transfer. And then finally, let's do that last one. So last one is a constant pressure process. So our work equation is pretty easy. We know what it is because we have our volumes and our pressure. We know for a constant pressure process, this is our work input. Now, is there heat addition or is there heat output? 
There is. Um, and in this case, we're going to have to take into account this full equation again. So for my constant pressure process, it is not saying it's adiabatic. It's um, not saying that the energy in the system is constant. It can all change. And so I have all three of these guys coming into play. I have work in. I have heat out. And then I have my change in the system, which is just equal to my mass flow rate. Or sorry, my mass. That should be mass flow rate. My mass times my internal energy at the final state minus my internal energy at the beginning state. Looks good. And from that, I get this value. So each time we're just applying conservation of energy again and again and again, we just have to look at it. We have to say, OK, what is staying constant? What is changing? What can go in? What can't go in? We go from there. And when we do that, we get to our answer finally. We have all of our heats. We have all of our um, works. And we solve the problem. So thanks for listening, everybody. That's up to the end of this chapter. I hope this helps you. And I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.